afternoon. This is your Pan-African show called Africa with your host, Kazalor Seifu. And uh, today we have a great guest for you. Uh, first of all, we say welcome to our studio. Thank you for having me. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, my name is Trevor Phillip, and I'm originally from the twin island state of Antigua and Barbuda. Okay. That's in the Caribbean. Okay. Not far from Jamaica. So, once again, we say welcome. Thank you. So, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, your how should I say, high school, because I, I found a few interesting points during your high school years. So I want you to touch a little bit of that, and just so we know who, and how you got your name, Kulai. Originally from Antigua and Barbuda, Twin Island State, I grew up in an area, a village called Barnes Hill, which is in the St. George's Parish. And uh, my schooling was uh, culminated around at the age of 17. And I graduated from the high school that I was attending. But during that time at high school, uh, we had a fun day, a sports day. And that was my first time attempting to broadcast. Mm. So I was a broadcaster for the event, what was happening on the sports at the time. So you had quite an interesting high school life. Somewhat, to an extent. Uh, before I graduated from high school, around the age of 17, I remember there was one particular event. It was a sporting event taking place at the school. Mm -hmm. So I organized to have a microphone and a small PA that I could give live commentary or live announcements about different houses and the position that they were um, changing at the time, depending on the winning scores, mm -hmm. etc. So that was my first experience as a live host for an event. Beautiful. Pretty much after that, 17 years old, I emigrated to Canada. My mom, she arranged for me to come to Canada and even to continue my studies there. Uh, because at the time, had I stayed any longer in the Caribbean, then it means that I would be what they call an independent person rather than a dependent child. Mm -hmm. So I had to uh, relocate from Antigua to Montreal, Quebec, Canada. You went <laughs> from being an island boy, correct? Yes. To go to Canada, and Canada snows. <laughs> that was an experience, but it I was my first transition. time. Yeah. How did you feel? How did it make you feel as a young African man? And also, was the transition easier than you think or was it a little bit hard? Well, rem reminiscing upon that time, um, it was more or less difficult. Mm. For one, it was my first time traveling abroad from the small island of 108 square miles, about 100,000 people. Wow. To a big major metropolitan city. And uh, schooling, I was going through my schooling. By the way, I must say, uh, I was studying to be an anesthesiologist uh -huh. once I arrived there. Um, I didn't really complete my subjects. I did not graduate, mm. so I did not become a doctor. But I eventually became a doctor of sound. We'll there get into go. that later on. Yes. If I can interject at this time, uh, my first two children, my first son, who kind of came into my life and kind of changed my educational situation because now I have a responsibility of a child. Mm -hmm. That first son and my first daughter, they're both now doctors in Canada. First born, an MD, medical doctor, and the second one, child, is a daughter. Uh, she's a dentist. So I guess that genes that uh, is still uh, spreading. 
However, my time in Canada was quite uh, an experience. And I was totally um, experiencing a whole new lifestyle, a whole new concept for the first time. So it took some years. And if I may say right now, uh, I lived in Canada 39 years. So it was good to you. In some ways, yeah. in many ways, I can't deny that. You went from a small island, you went to Canada, and while you were in Canada, you were in school. But then you also got the opportunity to get on the radio. That's true. Yeah, so I'd <laughs> like to know how that opportunity arose or how it presented itself to you because it must have felt good. Absolutely. Because you obviously enjoyed being uh, a broadcaster. Yes, indeed. And uh, there was a radio station, an AM radio station in Montreal. They were established somewhere in the 60s. So there was one host there on that station who had a reggae program. And uh, some of the music that he was playing, I thought that I could contribute to his program by um, presenting some of the local musicians and the local talents that were in Montreal. And when I went to him and presented my idea to him for the first time, he welcomed not only myself, but the idea to the show. And from that point, I started inviting some of those same young artists who really wasn't really an artist at the time. They were performing with the bands and so on, but they didn't have any recording or any track or anything to acclaim themselves as an artist. So by bringing them to the radio station, playing their songs, and doing some interviews, now the wider population start to know about them. Or should I say the local scene started to know about these individuals. And it kind of snowballed from there. It grew. Interesting that you talked about it because my next question was how you connect the young up-and-coming artists. <laughs> and I'm assuming that's how you actually introduced them. So that's how you supported them, bringing them onto the radio show and ex you know, exposing them. That was my first initial way okay. to uh, be doing something for the community. Okay. Because I had the accessibility to the radio station CFMB and Mr. Mike Biscott at the time. It was um, okay for me to invite them, ask them questions like we're doing now about their personal entity. And from that point on, I myself am a musician as well. Okay. So I knew them from before. Okay. Which means that I started doing my own uh, band and my own personal production at my home and then I would invite them to come to my place to do recording so that you can have now your first record. Uh -huh. At the time we were still talking about 45 vinyl and even LP mm -hmm. on vinyl. So that's where my whole musical um, deviation started from actual radio hosting. Okay. But I still work the two both together simultaneously yeah, when go, the they opportunity go, they arrives. Go, they, go, they go very well together. Definitely so, because eventually later on, uh, the International Reggae Festival, Montreal International Reggae Festival, came about. And since I'm on the radio, then I was now promoting for the festival when artists come from Jamaica to Canada, Montreal to promote the event that's going to be taking place during the summertime, um, it gave me even added boosts mm. and even more inside connectivity 
to the members and staff of the festival organization. And from that point on, then that's another part of the story. Yeah. Beautiful. So why do you think it was necessary connecting Canadian and American artists with your Jamaican and African counterparts? Our roots is definitely the motherland. Right. We see Africa as our motherland, DNA ancestral descendants who were brought to the Caribbean during the time of slavery. So there was always a, a beckoning for Africa mm -hmm. by most of the people who are still currently in the Caribbean. To work with artists from Jamaica, it was an international platform, me being in Canada. Whereas making that connectivity Reggae music really started from African music, right. the drum. And the timing of the drum, especially. Mm -hmm. So that means that taken from our roots and building upon it, here comes reggae music. Out of ska and mento, and then uh, roots reggae, and so on, dance hall, etc. It evolves. Mm -hmm. Now, with the influence from Africa as our homeland and the Jamaican reggae music, I find that it's interesting to combine the traditional with the new. And even right here in Ethiopia, we now see it. The Gary, mm -hmm. the Gary, the Gary is driving on the same road with the Mercedes Benz. <laughs> That's the old merging, with, merging the new. with the new. <laughs> so it's a concept of mine uh, that I had from many, many years ago. Now I'm here in Ethiopia. So that's another transition based upon that concept. Okay. What are the collaborations you've done with major artists? And if you could name a few of the artists you've worked with. Well, the highlight and the high point of uh, myself working with international artists, or should I say, uh, they're not just reggae artists, because mm -hmm. I've worked with other major groups as well. So let me go into that. First of all, we were doing some studio work at my establishment in Canada. So some of the international reggae artists that came for the reggae festival, and by the way, that festival went on for 14 years. Wow. Yeah. So some of the artists that came, once they were invited to the radio station, and I did interviews with them, we became more or less on a personal basis, friends. Eventually, a few of them came to my studio and did some recording. So the biggest name acts would be Ken Booth, uh, Carlton Livingston, and Tabby from Mighty Diamonds. He's now deceased. May God his soul rest in peace, Tabby Diamond. And uh, those were the main three artists that I actually worked with in recording okay. in the studio. Apart from that, because of the festival, Maxi Priest, uh, Sean Paul, uh, Sanchez, Luciano, Capleton, uh, the Barry's Hammond, all the major, all the, major, all the majors, uh, and mainly because of me being a sound engineer and technician. You're their best friend. <laughs> Just about. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we make it good sound good Absolutely. or we make it sound really bad. Exactly. Feedbacks and stuff. <laughs> you also worked with young artists. What sets of skills do you bring? Can they get that in school? Where? The set of skills that you give the young artists? In Canada. We're in still Canada. in Canada. Yeah, yeah, we're still in Canada All because right. that's where you've... All right. Worked more. As a mentor, I coach them into voice. Okay. Into proper presentation and uh, uh, delivery of mm -hmm. their vocals. Uh, 
I'm not a voice trainer, but I can give some ideas or insight as to how they can project their voice to receive the most impact from the listening audience. Apart from that, as a sound engineer, I also teach how to utilize new technology. Analog technology is the old school. And now in our modern recent time, digital technology has come on board. So for recording purposes during the studio, some of the individuals, they are interested in understanding and knowing how these equipment actually work. Now today we utilize the computer because there are several recording programs that are professional in itself that would give you the same quality sound as the old school analog reel-to-reel -reel tapes, mm. but it's on a digital-based platform. You did a big project with 22 yeah. artists in Canada. That's a big project. It is. I've it worked is. with one artist and that's a big project. <laughs> <laughs> 22 on the other hand. How did that unfold? Can you tell us some more details about that project? I will summarize that project into a very short narrative because it is uh, complex in its own mm -hmm. right. I'm sure. And um, at the time, it was during the COVID lockdown, I mentioned before. Now, I had a call from Shashamani. At first, I was not interested because of other issues on my personal side in Canada. But then, by talking to the individual, I heard something that really piqued my interest. And that was Ambassador Jasmine Rowe. Wow, I'm going to be talking to an ambassador in Ethiopia? So I said, okay, you know what, let me, let me talk to the ambassador. When I spoke to Miss Jasmine, uh, that lady from Shashamani, uh, it was mentioned to me that the Prime Minister had made a call for the community of Rastafarians, knowing what reggae music does for on a worldwide basis, even for apartheid in South Africa, knowing what reggae music is all about and what reggae music does for the spirit, for the soul, for the country, Ethiopia. It was asked of us to prepare a song to support the hashtag no more movement. At the time, it was the propaganda story that was going on uh, on CNN and BBC and et cetera, et cetera. As far as I understood being in Canada, I didn't even know that there was these issues. So we came together and I decided to do that project. Mm -hmm. Now, this project seems to be a very special case because having 22 artists from different countries around the world, including Ethiopia, that in itself was a challenge mm -hmm. because it has never been done before. Meaning, the closest thing or song, songumentary, the closest songumentary that came about was that song, We Are the World, with Michael Jackson and Cyndi Lauper and Lionel Richie, etc., etc. However, that track was written by, I think, one or two people, Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie, as far as I, my memory can. In our case, for this project, each of the artists on that particular songumentary are the original script writers or lyrical writers of their part only. So for each person, I took excerpts from their song and combined it together with editing to make this particular songumentary for Ethiopia. The title of that track is Stand Up for Ethiopia, 22 Artists. 
How long did it take? I want the whole process it now. Was, it <laughs> took uh, many sleepless nights on mm. my part for editing and the hours. And then I had to work the next following day because at the time I'm a contractor. Right. So I would go to bed probably three, four, sometimes five o'clock in the morning. Sometimes no sleep at all. Finish and then I leave, go to work, come yeah. back from work and back on the project again all night long. Wow. So it took us three months. It took you three months. And that three is also months. because everybody is on a completely different time zone. Time zone <laughs> and to coordinate wow. and to receive the sent mm -hmm. files and then having to edit and work on it. So that project um, includes, I would say, 11 countries. We starting with Canada, USA, England, Germany. Then we moved to Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, another Caribbean twin island state. Uh, then we moved to Kenya, okay. Ethiopia, uh, Nigeria, Tanzania and South Africa. So that looked to be more like 12 <laughs> countries. <laughs> However, on that project, we're speaking five different languages, oh. including Amharic, because uh, Shashamani brothers from Shashamani and the Rasta community there is also on that project, as well as Zeleke. From Tanzania, they speak in Swahili, uh, we have English, we have German, and we have Jamaican Patois. Can't leave that out. It's a language. <laughs> exactly. Jamaica have their own dictionary. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so they spread do. that to the world. <laughs> yes. I would also like to introduce another premier. Oh, brilliant. For Ethiopia as well. Okay. Because, like I said before, all of these artists on that one track, I only took some excerpts from their original song to make this song documentary. They have a whole They have one a song. whole entire track, <laughs> yes. just like uh, La Ex Diaz. Yes. They have a whole entire track. Yes. Now, if I would also interject that each one of those artists with those track is supposed to be com combined together into a, 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 a compilation. Okay. A compilation also for Ethiopia okay. because that project is not completed as yet. There were three phases to that project. The Prime Minister called, asked for the support of making the song. Each person recorded their own track, which should be now combined together into a CD. Mm. And on the third phase, all of those artists were supposed to come to Ethiopia for us to do one big show. Mm. Um, the word I'm looking for was charity. Mm. We wanted to do a charity show with all of these artists singing their own track. And then at the end, we make a big um, splash at the end with all of them singing stand up for Ethiopia. When you say we were going to you're not going to anymore? Or well, still we still would like to do still, it okay. because time and sponsorship to get those artists to come here to perform on, on an event that we would organize, you know, it takes time, organization, and seeking skills. for sponsorship and all of those other areas as well. Coordinating with um, other production producers, uh, event organizers, uh, if I may put this out there in the open right now. Yeah. We do intend, I do intend to establish an international Ethiopian reggae festival. So, uh, based upon my connection, my knowledge, experience with PA system and all of that, I do believe that we can have a successful event and this year too, this yes, year. Sir. Yes, sir.